Okay, so here we are at the uh, fluoride uh, showing of the great fluoride deception, and uh, here we have to keep the air out of our water. And we've got some very handsome looking t-shirts here, and uh, one of the volunteers helping out. So we've got some interesting displays coming up here. Well, you look very charming in your t-shirts here. Oh, We're, you, uh, oh that's great. You appear with a camera. Would you like to introduce yourself for the uh, for the news item? I'm Fluoride Free Linda. <laughs> fluoride Free Linda. And this is Fluoride Free Charlene and yes, Fluoride yes. Free David and Fluoride Free Michael. Well, this is just great. So, uh, just a quick rundown of our agenda tonight. Um, so we have a introduction in this. Linda's going to come up and do some things and that sort of thing. We're going to show a very short little film. Uh, then David's going to run through a quick PowerPoint that's uh, got a number of our points to it. Uh, then we'll be showing the fluoride reception, which is about 26 minutes long, very short. And then a Q&A at the end with uh, Dr. Pelizzeri and David sitting in these chairs and we'll give you guys a chance to ask any questions and address your concerns and um, I guess we'll go from there. So Linda, would you like to come up? Linda Clark, one of the... Can you hear me if I speak without the mic? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Good. Uh, I'm not going to speak for very long. I just basically wanted to thank a lot of people. Uh, I want to thank you folks for coming, um, and a little bit to thank some of the people who made this possible. Some of those people are the fluoridealert.org uh, fluoride people, um, and if you make sure you get the little flyer, because it's going to give you a lot of information. You're going to hear more tonight than you can digest, but at least it will get you started, and then you can continue with this and with any of us who share it. Um, the Fluoride Alert, Alert folks have a wonderful international website with extraordinary information on it. Um, and the PowerPoint that we're using tonight was given to us by Paul Connor, the Fluoride Alert. Um, and it was also given to us by Gilles Perron from Quebec. Uh, the folks in Quebec are extremely active with the Fluoride Movement. And so what we have for our PowerPoint tonight is a hybrid from Paul Connor and from Gilles Perron. Uh, so huge thanks to those folks for sharing their materials with us. We also have uh, people in Calgary working with us because they've been fluoride free for a couple of years now and they've been sharing a lot of their materials and their experience with you. It's just been fascinating to get to know all these wonderful people. Uh, so I think that's most of what I need to say. If you have questions, we're going to have a we'll have a paper or I think you might have some papers Write your questions down that you want the panel to address. Instead of doing a spoken question thing, we'll take your questions written down and then um, address them in the panel <coughs> towards the end of the evening. So, and I think the only other thing I'm going to ask is the folks who've been helping to put this evening together, if you wouldn't mind standing up for a moment, just so you can see this. It's been a small iron support for me. including the one you just watched. So if you want to go watch it once or twice again. Um, these things are all available on the web. There's another video that documents um, William Marcus, the man at the EPA. We talked about the cancer. So there's five of them. And the books, the fluoride reception, they're here as well. So you don't have to worry about that you forgot your pen. Just take this with the blue flyer. There you go. OK. Any questions? Um, I'm a victim of ciprofloxacin, which is concentrated fluoride. Um, that involved um, tendon damage, anxiety, <coughs> and a recent x-ray shows there may be bone cancer in my jaw. Um, what I want to know is if there are ways to neutralize or detox the effects of fluoride in your body. Would you like to hit that one first? 
I can hit, I can hit that one. I have no knowledge of it at all. <laughs> so I Where would I go? Never looked into that aspect of fluoridation, uh, so I can't, I can't go on. I read it boron. Boron? Boron. Available at the health food store. You know who tells her? Sorry, no. Uh, a little bit. Yeah. Another question? Well, it's not a question, but detoxifying the fluoride out of your body, is that what mm, you're pertaining yes. to? And you guys have no solutions for that? Um, or you're unaware of any solution? The only solution I know of is to not take in any more than you, than you possibly can and let your body try to eliminate what's there. That's all I can suggest. Okay. Joe? This is a public area. What you have seen has had any impact on... Can you speak up a little bit? Oh, I can any impact on... You obviously support fluoride. It's stated in your letters to the examiner. So I'm wondering, this information, has it impacted your opinion on fluoride? Will you do some research to find out? Because really, do no harm is what doctrine is all about. Did everyone hear the question? No. Well, I mean, I think what, I, what we've all seen was quite shocking. I don't think anybody would disagree that it was shocking. And, uh, I certainly think that there's um, been a lot of mistakes in the past. I mean, look at asbestos. They talked about asbestos. Uh, we know it's, it's a carcinogenic uh, substance. Tobacco, another one, lead. Um, so uh, certainly we don't want to repeat those kinds of mistakes. Um, I, I think the, but I, I do think, you know, we've just been through about an hour and a half of material that was quite biased and one-sided. Uh, I think to be fair, it would be good to see, to be able to uh, have both sides of this debate. And there's no way that I'm going to be able to do that in a few minutes. I won't bore you with even trying. But I think the, the film did ask a really good question. It said question, you know, it said question, question authority, question. And I think that's, uh, that we all have to uh, question and we have to make sure we have the best information, that the information is accurate. And I, I certainly believe that that's what is, is happening. I, I, I know, for example, that since that book was written, which was published, what, 2006? Mm -hmm. 2006? Mm -hmm. The book, right? Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, 2006, I think. So oh. since 2004, so since that book was published, there have been at least five different systematic looking at fluoride. And for those people who aren't familiar with the systematic review, it's a very um, meticulous look at all of the evidence, all of it, you know, both sides. And they hold it up to very uh, high standards. They look at the strength of the evidence. They And sometimes they can pool it. They can do meta-analysis. So there have been at least uh, five that I know of. The last one in 2012, done by the National Center, Collaborative Center on Environmental Health. The Cochrane Center is about to do another one. And, and all of these studies have been unanimous in finding that fluoride uh, has a benefit. You know, the benefit ranges. It depends on what the age of the child, the age of the person. Um, certainly, uh, they did not find that it was associated with when, when used in, in the levels we're talking about, which is, you know, one point, uh, one part per million or, or less, that it's not associated with any of these horrible, horrible things. We know fluorine is an extremely reactive element. I mean, it's deadly. We know that. But it's in the small amounts that we're talking about for fluoridation, um, they're not associated with some of these horrible industrial effects you saw with workers who were exposed to high levels. I mean, we know skeletal fluorosis can occur at high levels, but the levels that we're talking about in water are nowhere near those levels. And, and so the, the science is accumulating, you know, at the, as I said, it's being studied, it's been studied, it's about to be looked at again. 
Um, I've seen recent articles published, you know, as recent as November, looking at osteosarcoma <coughs> and Ewing's carcinoma in bone, looking at uh, fluoridation. Uh, this was in the UK. Again, finding no no increased risk. Uh, fluorosis, dental fluorosis. I mean, we, we spend a lot of time talking about dental fluorosis, and we know that that really is the one risk of putting wa uh, fluoride in water is dental fluorosis. We know that. Um, and uh, I worked in Stratford. I was a medical officer in Stratford. We had natural fluoride in our water, and lots of it. And we would warn parents, you know, not to use the tap water with their children uh, because it, it had a high levels of fluoride, and you could see fluorosis on the teeth. But the Canadian Health Measures Study just did a national study in Canada and looked at dental fluorosis, and in fact, they found that the levels of fluorosis were so low that they couldn't even report them. So, Can I interrupt? Yeah. Just for a second. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the levels of moderate and severe fluorosis were low enough that they couldn't report them. That's right. Not the very mild and the mild. And my contention is that the very mild and the mild are still a problem, and it's not just a cosmetic problem. Well, I mean, I, you don't have to take my word for it. I mean, we have a dentist at the health unit, and unfortunately she couldn't be here today, but I'm, I'm certain if she were here, she could respond. Um, it's not a problem for us. I think, actually, um, we probably saw more fluorosis back when uh, we were using a lot of water when dental toothpaste was, was being given to young children. And we know that children under the age of three don't, uh, will swallow a lot of it and probably ingested more fluoride from the toothpaste. So if anything, you know, I, I think it's, uh, I, I we're seeing less of that now because we aren't recommending using fluoridated toothpaste in young children under three. So we've, uh, so I think we're actually starting to see the benefits of even that. So to answer, it's a long, I'm sorry to be so long with it, um, but to answer your question, I think, you know, there is good science being done. I think the good science is reassuring. And, um, and uh, certainly it's showing that there is definitely a benefit. And when you consider that dental decay is um, the leading chronic disease, the leading chronic disease. Um, it certainly seems that um, there's a great benefit to all of us by adding fluoride to the water in small amounts. That's really Yeah, and I think we, sorry, I, just, I think we have links to the studies on our on our website. So you know, you don't have to take my word for it or David's word for it. We've got the links on our website. Please feel free to look them up and make up your mind. I suggest to our answer is going to have to be a lot shorter. Sorry, I'm going to be here Dr. Rosanna um, Elizari, why do you think that the 98% of European countries have opted to take fluoride out of their drinking water and have had no change in their, the, the dental condition? Why I do you think, do you know anything that about that? That's Correct, actually. I, I don't believe that they decided to take fluoride out of their water. I believe that many European countries are using other ways to provide fluoride. So I think I was with David that mentioned that several countries, um, for example, where they don't have centralized water supplies, uh, countries are adding fluoride to salt. Some countries, no, it's actually three sorry, countries. No, it's actually more than three. Countries. Um, and other countries are adding it to milk. So they're like, just like we add vitamin A and vitamin D to our milk to prevent uh, rickets. Some of the European countries are adding fluoride to their milk. However, those products are products you can choose to ingest or not choose to ingest, whereas the public water supply is in a different category. Yeah, I think, what do you know, feel about the personal choice aspect? Well, I think, you know, I think there's, I can certainly understand the issue of personal choice, you know, and I think there's often, I mean, this came up with the pasteurization of milk debate right. recently in Ontario, where people were suggesting that they should have a right to choose to, to purchase raw milk. Um, they should. All, and, um, and so sometimes there are competing interests within societies. 
that uh, certain groups, uh, so is it the right, you know, the rights of groups to choose versus the rights of other groups to benefit. And we make those decisions all the time. So for example, speed limits or um, speed bumps on roads, you know, we, we limit the rights of drivers to go at high speeds in order to protect pedestrians. Um, we do the same, um, you know, we do the same thing with our healthcare system here in Canada. You know, um, we say that, well, you might have more money than David, and so you could buy, well, whatever, you know, you should be able, if you had more money, you should be able to buy your way to faster treatment. But we say no. In fact, in Canada, our healthcare system is, it's need, right? It's how much it's need rather than ability to pay. So we make those sorts of trade-offs all the time. I don't so, think there's equivalent, really. No, I don't. Well, can, we, can we move on to another question, just because we're time, or we'll be here all night? Yeah, I had a question. Um, how much does it cost to put the fluoride in our Peterborough water? You gave a figure? Uh, three or four years ago, I was given a figure of 21,000. And, and how many units, or how much poundage, or uh, kilograms? Uh, I don't know. You Okay. Well, my curiosity is, how much would it cost the uh, industrial waste people to actually take that waste and properly dispose of it? Would it cost more or less than what it cost to buy it? I can tell you. Last figure I heard, $5,000 a barrel. And here's a little uh, part of the story, too, is that because it is a toxic waste before it gets sold out to the public, um, one of the things that they do down in the phosphate industry is that they'll pump this stuff into trucks and just drive trucks around in circles. Because when the, when it's in transit, it's no longer in store. You know what? So I, 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 can I, can I get in? Um, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me. Well, of course, we need both sides. Well, and thank you for giving me a thank few for minutes the versus the courage. Well, yeah. well, no, but I just I really want to respond to this whole thing about waste. Okay, it's not waste. It's not toxic. Yes, no it waste. <laughs> okay, you can call it waste, but the, let hear me out. Okay. It's not toxic waste. People, you can call it that and, and scare people, which is very effective. It's a it's a byproduct. Okay. Yeah. You're talking in circles. Come on. So it's a drug or a nutrient. some of the fluoride, that it uses some of the fluoride. Our teeth, our bones use some of it. Um, 
we get it as a byproduct. I agree. Waste implies that it is no longer of use. But obviously there's a science out there, and there may be two sides to the science, but there's certainly the side of pro-fluoridation that, that can use this. I mean, if we didn't believe in by -pro or using waste, we wouldn't recycle. So this is a, a, a use of, of a byproduct for a benefit, uh, or a perceived benefit, whatever which way you want to call it. But it, it's not a waste. It's not a let's throw it away type of thing. If we can reuse, then that's, I, as far as I'm concerned, that's uh, uh, the best option for both. It's a win-win scenario. If you could find one other use for hydrochlorosilicic acid other than to put in the water supply with the intention of preventing tooth decay, I'll stop calling it toxic waste and I'll call it micro. Is there one other use? Why do you need want more than one use? Well, because it shows that it's a byproduct and not just... You, the science is, is saying that it's not good for you. Our science is saying it's not good for you. Well, you're, yeah, you just you just called your science the only science. There's more than one science. This debate's been going on for what 70 years now, and I doubt we're going to solve it tonight. But I don't call it I don't call it waste. I'm, it's my understanding that arsenic is a carcinogen, and that the optimal amount or acceptable legal amount of arsenic to add to water is zero because it's carcinogenic. If you look at the PUC website and see the breakdown of hydrofluorosilicic acid, it includes arsenic and lead. Aside from whether the fluoride is good or not good, why are we putting a known carcinogen into the water? If you say, well, it's only a little bit, I don't think that's the law that you can do just a little bit of something that's carcinogenic. Wait, did you want to respond to Linda's question? <clears throat> well, you're correct in that, that the hydrofluorosilicic acid does have a, a level of arsenic, but I always like to look at things in perspective. If we look at the level of arsenic in the, wa in the raw water, in the river water, we're talking about uh, 20, on average over the last five years about 27 parts per billion. And we're adding, or sorry, 0.27 parts per billion. So is, is that hydrofluorosilic acid no, we find in the our, river? This is arsenic. arsenic. This is arsenic in our river water. Arsenic. Okay, so you might call it a natural arsenic, but it's in the river water. It's background arsenic. So it's 0.27 parts per billion. Now, when we add fluoride to the water, it does add a little bit of arsenic to the water. Yes, that's, that's true. There's no question, there's no debate on that. It's about uh, 0.08 parts per billion. So we're going, we're adding about, uh, you know, very little amount. We're moving up from about 0.27 parts per billion to about 0.36 parts per billion on, uh, for our arsenic. So the, acceptable, the acceptable level in drinking water is 25 parts per billion. So we're not even one of the 25. In, in Canada, but in the U.S. And then in the U.S. it's king. And they also have what they call a maximum contaminant level goal. And that implies that this is what we would like to have if economically it made sense or we could afford to do it. And for arsenic, that number is zero. If I could get up, if I could, well, if, if, you want, if you want pure water, then you have to get distilled water because water has minerals in it naturally. Every water has a different fingerprint, as I call it. And our water happens to be a surface water. There's, through its natural progression through the earth and through the nature, through the water course, it's going to pick up some of those minerals. So if you want nothing in your water, then you'll have to distill it. But as I understand, distilled water is bad for the body because it pulls minerals out of the body. Uh, water is a natural for 31 years, I've never had anyone show me a piece of research to back that up. So if you've got it, show me. Otherwise, don't make that kind of Water is a natural salt. It is the You're claiming something salt. that is, no, has no science to back it up. So don't say it unless you can back it up. Well, you said several things today that has no science. This is the way she will not take control of your body. I was just wondering, what is status? It's a poisonous product. Out of the, and it 
those cows and whatever, and the farmers and everything. So what is done by the, to the product to, to that they can put it in from a gas to uh, put it into these tanks, then it becomes a non-poisonous thing. What is chemically done? I, I think it's, it's uh, I think they, they make it into a salt. What they do is they scrub it with water, basically. And, and it creates a, so, the, the hydro flow silicic acid, the hydro being the water part. So it makes it less reactive, um, so that it can be transported. My question is, why are we doing this? For, to prevent cavities? Is that the primary reason? When the Dental Association did all their studies during the time when they were studying fluoride for uh, putting in the toothpaste, it's also, it, um, it stated that there was very good results as far as uh, de de um, decreasing the amount of cavities. These are topical applications have been shown to reduce tooth decay. Do tooth decay. Uh, why do we have to all take this fluoride in our mouths when we can have a choice of taking the topical application <coughs> or using uh, fluoride toothpaste? We don't have to have it in our water. It's an unnecessary <laughs> So one of the reasons that it's beneficial in water is because actually fluoride uh, has both systemic effects as well as topical effects. And it's systemic. for dental caries? Yeah. And uh, and so the systemic effects um, happen uh, while the teeth before the teeth even erupt. So we're talking about young children where the teeth are still being formed inside the gums. And in that in that period of time Fluoride actually has a systemic effect. It strengthens the enamel. It makes it less, um, less. Uh, le it, it makes it stronger to resist the acids that the bacteria create. And in fact, in that, um, when it's done at that time, the actual benefit is the greatest. When they look at, uh, it's up to 60% reduction in dental caries when it's used in very in the youngest children before the teeth even erupt. So why What's do men have to have it in their water? Pardon me? Why do men have to have well, it in their water, so once, just if only for uh, pregnant women? Well, once the teeth erupt, it still, it still has a benefit, and the very low levels that are in the uh, water have a benefit in that it's in the, in the saliva. So, I mean, it's actually found that these, uh, more exposure to lower levels uh, is even more beneficial. So that's why you see effects of 20 to 40 percent uh, all across, you know, for adults, uh, even for seniors. As seniors age and, you know, gums begin to recede and more of the tooth is exposed, the fluoride in the water can benefit seniors as well. And it's for much of all the different... Theories, for preventing uh, yeah, yeah. And, and all of the, I mean, all of those uh, things you mentioned are all effective. So, you know, uh, fluoride toothpaste, uh, fluoride uh, sealants, uh, varnishes, you know, those are all uh, effective. But they're also very, very, they're more expensive. So, getting back to the question about how much does it cost. Fluoride is very pre prevalent in, in, in the toothpaste. Now, a yeah. number of communities have stopped putting fluoride in their water and have not seen an increase in dental problems with their population. Actually, that's, that's not true. The communities that have, that have discontinued their fluoride, actually, there's, they are, there has been documented increases in uh, dental decay. And in fact, even Calgary, somebody mentioned Calgary earlier, it's only been, what, two years, two or three years? And dentists in Calgary are already starting to, uh, to report increased dental rates of dental decay. Is that so, documented on the website too, Dr. The, the Calgary is, is still, it's anecdotal, I believe. There's a study, There's a study underway, Linda. Um, and here in Ontario, what we've been asked, we've actually been asking that we do a study because we have had several communities where they've discontinued their fluoride. And so we're asking, this is a perfect time that we could actually do this research to see 
you know, uh, interestingly, just two weeks ago, there was a study published uh, looking at children in South Korea, where they had compared children who had uh, fluoride removed from their water in communities where it had been present and then it was removed to children who had never had the fluoride. And they were still able to show a benefit. Children who had it, remember I said in those early years when teeth are still forming, it has its highest effect. And so they were able to show that the effect of fluoride persisted like five to six years after its removal. So, so it's, it's going to take long-term studies to see the full impact, but uh, definitely there are studies that have been published that have shown it, and I, and I think here in Ontario we should be doing those studies as well. Question. A question for the doctor. Um, I'm curious if you're critical of the corporate ties to the studies that you're talking about, After, especially when you agree that the, the film is shocking and it shows those corporate connections, those corporate funded studies or the implications of researchers being fired for having an opposition to you. And I'm curious, beyond that question, if you believe in the precautionary principle. So I, I think you all, one always has to be cautious with industry funded uh, research because of the uh, conflict, it's essentially a conflict of interest. Um, and uh, when you, when uh, systematic reviews are done and meta-analyses are done, you can actually, uh, there are tools that you can apply to actually detect bias. I mean, there's, there's different kinds of bias and, and so you can actually try and detect it, you can, um, you can uh, correct it. One of the ways you can actually, it's interesting, we just had grand rounds on evidence-based medicine a couple of weeks ago and um, Dr. Guy was here and he was looking at big pharma and, and big pharma funded research and one of the ways they catch you is that, I mean often the research is, is well done, methodologically it's, it's well done, but what they often, they tend to inflate the, the benefits. So they'll, they'll, they'll say, you know, they'll look at the, so if you look at the results and then you look at the discussion, they're, they, um, they overemphasize the benefits and make it sound better than it really is. So one of his recommendations was, you know, don't read the discussion. Just, just look at the results and, uh, and don't get swayed into that. So there are ways that you can actually try to either adjust or actually you can even go as far as, as ignoring research that's been done by industry. You can, you can even do it that way. So there's ways you can do that to try and determine what is the truth here, you know, what is, is there a fact, is it a benefit, is there a harm. Um, as far as your um, second question on precautionary principles, I mean as it applies to flora. So, uh, I mean we know, I think, I mean the maximum concentration is, you know, one that, that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, allowable or recommended is you know 1.5 and we're seeing levels of 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 here in Peterborough so we're half we're half of, of where we could be and I think that's that's good practice you know we, we're, we're keeping the levels down as low as possible so that you know it's a trade-off as low as possible so that we get the benefits and we try and we try and mitigate or prevent the risks so that we don't get dental fluorosis in our children. So I think that's that's a pretty good approach. I got one one question left. Sorry, we got to get out of here by nine. Okay, I want to talk sure. about the uh, given the maybe small levels, but we know that there's lead and arsenic in this hydrochloric acid, and I don't think anyone would deny that there's cumulative toxins. And how can you morally justify any product put into the water, no matter how small the amount of lead and arsenic? How can you justify morally adding them? Well, let me correct you. There, there's no lead. Okay, yeah. so let's say just arsenic. So okay, we've heard about that. Here. How do I justify it? Mm -hmm. Well, we put chlorine in our water. Water. Yeah, but it's yeah. still a chemical. It's a chemical. It's a chemical. We put chlorine in the water because do you really want a Walkerton? No. No. 
No. I mean, so these are the trade offs we made. Well, actually, chlorine is, if anything, if I had to choose which one I'm more concerned about, I'm more concerned about chlorine. I mean, the byproducts that. But excuse me, that chlorine is treating the water, not the human. Yeah. Pardon me? It's treating the water, not the human. Well, we're in. No, no. I, I, we, it's, it's keeping the water safe so that we don't get sick. So that we don't get sick, right? So it's a, it's a chemical that we add. It's a water treatment. We do it because of the, the because of the benefits. You know, we're we're prepared to say we're going to add chlorine to keep our water safe, so that people aren't going to die from E. coli. And yes, we know that adding chlorine to the water creates. I mean, I think we increase the risk of cancer. You know, uh, I think it by. I mean, there's a slight increased risk of cancer because of the byproducts that are formed when the chlorine. Uh, it reacts with organics in the in the water, but that's a trade off. And, and as a, a society, we make those trade offs all the time. So, so similarly with fluoride, the trade off. Well, let me just finish with fluoride. The trade off at 0 0.6, you know, 0 0.6 or 0 0.7. The trade off is dental fluorosis. You know how much the benefit is. We help pe we help keep teeth safe and, and from from decay. The trade-off is there's an, a little an increased risk for dental fluorosis, but we've actually seen that that there's very little. I mean, I think we've really we've been able to do a good job at finding the right level of fluoride in order to maximize its benefits and minimize its risks. I got like two minutes left, so somebody's <coughs> something that's really. So is it a drug? No, it's not a drug. It's an element. It's a. It's a. It's, it's used for treatment of a. Of health health care. It's a health treatment. You're saying. It's a. It's a preventive treatment for sure. So it's yeah, it's a drug. preventive. Well, no, because the 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 uh, definition of the of a drug and you had it up. I think um, was that it, it's manufactured. Uh, and I was myself wondering. Well, okay, so. Why is it a why are elements why are nutrients not considered drugs? I mean, is it because they come from the rock from the from the earth's surface? I mean, is it because they're if they're not really being manufactured? They're being extracted. They're being. I think it's because they're necessary for human life. Nutrients. Nutrients. Right. Drugs That's are because they're making a flame. Well, you're making right. a flame. Yeah. Of so I, I mean I don't I, I I don't so you know I think between us we might be able to come up with with the answer. But the it, so it's not a drug. It's not classified as a drug. I don't consider it a drug. Um, and as I said, I think I tried to explain. I think it has its benefits, and I think it's uh, you know given given the, the the great benefits, it's it's uh, certainly worth a small, very small risk. David, got anything left to say? No. Just talking about benefits. This is Lawkins' report. Canadian studies do not provide systematic evidence that water fluoridation is effective in reducing tooth decay in contemporary child populations. David, what was the year of Lawkins? 1999. Is that new information and, and about since then? Yes. Uh, there, as I said, since 2007 alone, there have been at least five uh, internationally done systematic reviews. So the evidence continues to accumulate. That's almost 10, 20 years worth of evidence since, that, since he did his work. So Lawkins. Walker's conclusions were wrong. No, well, he concluded it was a benefit. I mean, his, that his conclusion was, despite the fact that there were differences were small, that did, he said, okay, he says, uh, although there were, there were design weaknesses, there were methodological flaws, the balance of evidence suggests that rates of dental decay are lower in fluoridated than non yes. So And read really the next part. The magnitude of the effect is not large in absolute terms sure. and is often not statistically significant and may but, not be a clinical So what significance. I'm saying is that so, since then, <laughs> since then, there's been more, more evidence to actually they can now quantify the effect. And when we look at numbers, for example, numbers needed to treat, we know now that to prevent dental decay in one child, we need to treat seven. Numbers needed to treat is seven. So that's all that has happened since since he did his work. That's all evidence that has emerged since then. Well. If there was a link between the uh, fluoride and the hyperactivity issue that, that, that um, I can't remember her name, 
Phyllis somebody. If that turned out to be true, would you revisit this whole situation? Well, I think if it did have a bad side effect like that, oh, I it sure. would be... That would be very... Would and be I, very I, mean, I wrote her name down. I'm, I'm going to definitely uh, look, look her up. But I certainly... Um, I, I'm not aware of her work. I, I have seen reviews of the Chinese studies that... Were you the one that talked about? And I mean, and those studies have been reviewed and found to be very methodologically weak, and that the they can't uh, the results uh, have not been accepted because of those weaknesses. So, I, but I don't know her work, and I definitely would like to read about it. I yes, my goodness, that was quite. Uh, that was quite David, good. last comment. One thing I don't think I don't know how you can argue with the numbers that I gave for bottle fed infants. Oh, um, we've got some actually, we brought some uh, information we for parents. We've actually done the numbers ourselves, David. So where am I wrong? You're, you're, wow, how much time do we have? The <laughs> 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 Association gave a number. Yes. They said the number, 50 to 70 micrograms per kilogram of body weight per day. So, so we've done, we've done the math, we've used, using Peterborough water, and we've actually got the numbers. Do we actually have links? Uh, well, we well, can you point us to stuff us. that's not on your website? Like, <laughs> well, well, you know, I'm just, it's its the classic, like, here's our argument. It's our argument. It's on our website. Well, and these no, are the, like, the government things that it's are... It's not, what we've tried to do with our website is, we've tried to, it's not our Are you presenting any evidence that suggests you, it's not good for you? We give you the links to the systematic reviews. Because All of that's, them? It, are, like the ones that are also saying it's not good for you? Are you pointing people aware, to that? Michael, I'm not aware that there has been a systematic review right. that has shown that. Because when you, right. when you well, that's great that you admit that, that, that you're not aware of that. And other people are. There was primary literature out there. I'm sorry, we've got Yeah, we've got it, Carl. And, and, I'm on the hook for 9 o'clock. <laughs> a big round of applause for both of these guys. And Thank you.